Thanks, Jason. And so now Oliver will grill me on what I, well, uh, the, uh, <laughs> that's the thing, you know. So, like, so you do, you do that amazing talk, <laughs> and then I come up with the weebly me 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 <laughs> question. And that's going to be very tedious. I'm also never quite sure why these are called far side chats normally, but now I know it's the intellectual fire of the audience that will that that, that will that will fire us up. I feel the warmth. <laughs> yeah, I feel the war feel the warmth already. Okay, I want to go to a point about science for the people. Yep. and changing the physical basis of everything and hitting the bell at the New York Stock Exchange. If you're changing the physical basis of everything, you're now really plugged in as a company to the financial basis of like your company yep. and the current economy. How do you square that with being um, an evangelist for a technology that, as you say, if it was applied to iPhones, would make Apple go away? Great question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit. Yeah, so, so I think there's, are certain industries going to be disrupted in a way by this technology that's like not positive for them? For sure, for sure, right? Like I think that was true of computing, right? Like, yeah, like no question about it. Financial industry, movie, media, newspapers, all the things, right? Like all lots of disruption from that. I actually think that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's actually pretty healthy. I'm not worried about that. Some, pe some industry, people fight you, but at the end of the day, if, if you know, they tried to fight the internet too, you lose, mm -hmm. right? So, 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 so I'm not actually worried about that. Subtly different point you're making, which is like, hey, you're a corporation, right? Like, like isn't your optimization make as much money as possible? Aren't you going to just like screw everything and not care about the impact of the technology? And so we've given some, you know, thought to that, again, guided by our human practices training, uh, you know, out of iGEM. Um, and one of the things we've been doing at Ginkgo is we have uh, two classes of shares in the company. So if you think about a public company, the way that it operates is the power of the corporation is actually controlled by the shareholders of the corporation because they're the ones who elect the board. And then the board hires and fires me, right? They hire and fire management, all right? And so, so the shareholders vote the board, board controls management, thus shareholders kind of control management, shareholders control the company. That's the gist of a, a US or just general C Corp globally, all right? So what we've done at Ginkgo is we have two classes of shares, A and B. B is for bioworkers, the people that work at the company, and it has 10 times the vote of the A shares. All right? And that means that the actual human beings at the company, should they own a certain percent, and today bioworkers own, you know, call it 20 plus percent, that the, the, they can outvote the B, or sorry, the A. All right? And that allows them to take their human influence and put it on the company. Now, they're still large shareholders. Maybe they want the stock price to go. Yeah, they want to make money too, so they have to balance it. But they are not just like a, a, an arm's length investor exclusively focused on returns in the absence of caring about the impact. And so that's one of the hacks we're doing uh, to try to solve that problem. That's re right. really interesting. My colleagues who write about business most of the time have noted that there's a real thing here about in theory, the economist is very in favor of one class of shareholders because it's the most economically efficient. Yeah. It will not surprise you to know that the economist newspaper has more than one class of shareholders. <laughs> exactly. And that's because we really value in editorial independence. And so time, a certain that, so, so, but I actually yeah. wanted to go, I mean, those are two great aspects of what I was going up. But the third one was, I, I, I suppose, the, the, the even bigger question. You're sort of talking about a post-scarcity future, and that's not a future that we know how to understand, and, and a, not necessarily a future we know how people make money from. Yeah, I, I'm sympathetic to this. I, you know, I, I think there's like this phrase like, hey, you know, the, the phrase like grows on trees mm -hmm. is sort of like, a, a, you know, uh, synonymous with like, it's infinite, right? Mm -hmm. Like money doesn't grow on trees, because our sense is like, Biology produce, produces abundance, mm -hmm. right? So I think you're, that's not wrong. I, I think people like jump to that a little too soon. Like I think it'll be like our grandkids, grandkids. So we're just disrupt really so we're disrupting the future of the contestants' children. I, like when will you like have <laughs> a system that's like post-capitalist, post-scarcity, all that? I, I think it's to me it, there's a lot of pieces. Like for example, we're roughly infinite in data and compute mm -hmm. and all, and yet we still manage to somehow put all the little fences around it and figure out how to make it rival, right? Like, so, so you know, I, it's not obvious to me, like, how that's going to play. I think there's a, there's a much bigger social, like, the, mm -hmm. the point I was making about, like, 
Mm -hmm. Like, if you don't like capitalism, organize, mm -hmm. right? Like, because, like, that system is going to still be there, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and what you're talking about post-scarcity is sort of like post-capitalism, post-scarcity. It's a, it's a bigger social question. And if you want that to happen, you've got to organize. I liked, incidentally, to remind people uh, that grows on trees doesn't mean free. And if you don't believe me, try to buy some almonds at a fancy <laughs> store. Correct. Um, yeah, yeah. But you were talking about... Um, Changing tax slightly, you were talking about the important, uh, importance of human practices and the importance of understanding the impact of what you're doing. Um, what do you see as the long-term impact of something, of something that grows out of something like your concentrics, the, of ubiquitous biological surveillance? Yeah. So, so this to me is, is like a catch-up mm -hmm. on something that we should have had probably 15, 20 years ago, right? Like, like the, the technologies to start to... Ba like, by the way, we're testing in like five airports mm -hmm. and we caught BA, I forget which one, two or three, literally 40 days before it got pulled in a hospital and got sequenced. We weren't looking at every airport. We were just looking, right? So, so there's this dynamic of like, right now, we just don't look, right? Like we don't look at what's in the air in this room. We have no... Mon Meanwhile, on our phones, everything is being... You know, we look at all those zeros and ones, right? Like when you walk... You know, like, like, like the amount of monitoring we have on other types of things is crazy. And on ATCs and Gs, it doesn't exist at all. And, and so I would argue this is a tool right alongside uh, vaccines, right alongside therapeutics as a way to, to reduce infectious disease. Because if I just knew who had an infectious disease, I could tell them to stay home. Right? That's and, the question, like, though. I mean, but if you tell them to stay home, how do you really tell them to stay home. So I, I mean, that's where sort of like yeah. ubiquitous surveillance becomes a more worrying thing. Yeah. Now, I don't think anyone in this room worries about, well, it may be no one in this room worries about closed circuit TV cameras. Yeah, Certainly no one worries about sampling the air in the same way that they might do that. What I'm saying is that once you yep. build the infrastructure in, say, a place like Saudi Arabia, yep. what happens? Yeah. Yeah, so, so my view on this is, I, I, so I think is a key topic when it comes to caring how the platform is used, mm -hmm. is how do we do this right, okay? And so like, there's a number of tools. Number one, some of the best technologies so far are aggregate collection. Mm -hmm. Things like wastewater, things like air monitoring. There you're kind of just getting like, where is it in this building? Is it in this plane, right? Like that's useful. I think you want to be very, very careful when it comes to any type of human genetic data, mm -hmm. right? Like there's a whole road there that's like, privacy, monitoring of people, that whole thing. And I think you kind of, you want to treat that very, very differently and than everything else. But if, as a human, I'm also a microbiome, where do I... Uh, what, I mean, at that some sounds point, that, like a tricky question, but right. it is a real question. It's a real question, yeah. I, I mean, I think we're pretty far from that being like a, a good signature just yet, you know, right? Um, but I think that is something to worry about in the future. But I think that's kind of where the rubber's going to meet the road. I, I think, I think for, from my view, there's a, a fair set of technologies that can be done without like a lot of privacy implications that just give us like hurricane warning. Mm -hmm. Like this thing's coming to New York, it's coming, it's this much loaded up already and we need to get ready. Like we should have that. Right. And, and, and by the way, like I was talking to Tom about this, you know, Tom was telling me back, you know, in Boston when he was a kid, you had two hours warning for a hurricane. Two hours warning for a hurricane, right? Like, like, like I grew up in Florida. That's obscene. Yeah, you know, that's an like, absurdity, right? But like, that's that's us with infectious disease today. We're like, surprise, it's it's taking over New York. The hospitals are blowing up. That's how we found out. Yeah, like that that is that's insane, right? And and so like, I think you have to balance this. It's a, it's a complicated topic, but I, I do think there's a fair amount of technology we can develop before you run into a lot of that stuff that would. I mean, we're starting from zero. Um, so so, but you're right. I mean, it, it needs to be done with care. Okay, now, now, quick fire question. You've just got off the red eye. Yeah. How, what, what would be your 50-50 date over under for when you will get off a red eye that flies with biologically made fuel? Oh, so, uh, well, it's quick already, fire. yeah, 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 yeah. So, 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 there, the, there are, so in Europe, uh, there is already sustainable aviation fuel regulations that have actually created enough demand for renewable fuel that they can't supply it, mm -hmm. right? So, so the answer is like already you can, okay? The, the question is though, is it scalable, right? Like, like the fundamental problem with the, with the fuels today is none of the biological solutions are, are scalable. They're, they're 
you can collect some waste, and that's sort of scalable until you run out of it, like literally cooking oil and things like that. But there's not a lot of great things today that really work at scale. Now, do I think that's some of what are, should be the iGEM projects of this year? Yeah, I hope so. Right? I, I see it coming, but like today, it's, we're still in this in-between zone of you're unlikely to have it happen because there's so little fuel being made. Okay, for good I'm reason. Gonna, I'm still going to say, which year, as a, okay, fine. A, as a <coughs> which sure. year do you get off the plane in Paris? And it's fully loaded with biofuel. Having not added to CO2. Ten years. Ten years? Yeah. Okay. Well, if it's I, the only one that we're going to do that for, by the way. Like we won't make liquid fuels for anything but planes. I think everything else will go batteries, but planes you have. To. That's a good point. So if iGEM stays here, we meet here again in 10 years and we find out how you flew in. Yeah. Cool. Done. Okay. You see, one of the things is, you know, it's not just that if this year's project, you've got to plan for the future. You've got to plan for people inviting you back. Actually, um, that, that is a point I would make. Like, this is a thing I did not realize, like, when I was in iGEM, this is like, I don't know, you're young or whatever. But, like, a lot changes in 20 years. And, and like, you will, I promise go through another, like, you will be around another 20 years. So, like, you are going to experience a whole bunch of change. And, and yeah, stuff like this will happen. And you can think on that time scale. Like, this is what Tom, Tom taught us at Ginkgo, was, like, don't be in such a rush, right? Like, like plant things that are going to take long to grow. It's okay if it's not all happening overnight. Like, make the decisions that make more sense in the long term. And holy crap, did that pay off for us. Mm -hmm. Like, that is the reason that, like, we are where we are today. And, and like, so you all are so young. Make bets that are 10 or 20 year bets. Like you'll still be young, it'll be 20 years and, and holy crap, like if that thing pays off, it's nuts. So, you know, I'm, I'm telling you, it's nuts. And, and so, but people don't, they make like two year bets because they're like, I can only think about the next two years. So is this right? like, and you're like, you're, you're 20, right? Like, like, you know, I promise. So, so, so I, I really encourage that long, longer term, especially in this group, like it will pay off for you. Do you think older people should think longer term than younger people or shorter term because of the actual built in biological issues? Shorter term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be all about partying. That's what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, I can't believe Randy. I, I, you know, Randy and Tom still grinding away. That, you won't see me doing that. Yeah, but, but <laughs> okay, that's in, that's in 20 yeah. years' time. We will zoom in or whatever we use then to Jason on his beach and find that's out right. why he gave it all up. Yes, uh, reading I'm book. betting you we won't. Um, you're talking about um, talking to Fortune 500 people about seeing the future. They still don't apparently get the future. You were talking about... Um, acquiring Zymogen, yep. you wouldn't have been able to do that if people, other people have wanted to invest in Zymogen more. You kind of got it at a bargain price. Sure. Why don't they get it? Um, I, I, so I think the reality with, with like industry leaders, like these big companies in certain categories, is, is they, they can just make a lot of money doing smart things on the back of all of what they've built already that it is very hard for like the most important thing to be some disruptive thing that's going to matter five or 10 years to them. It's really, it, it is structurally hard. Like to, to some first approximation, startup companies shouldn't exist. How the heck could a company with, you know, start the company with five people? How could it possibly compete with these like monstrous corporations of 20,000 people? You know, but it's like, it should be impossible. And, and the reason is structurally, the leaders in those companies cannot focus on that other stuff, they have, to, they have to focus on where the action is, which is their existing business. It's just true. I don't, I don't, I honestly, I, I worry about it for Gingo at some point, but like, it, it's, not yet, but like, it's, it's structurally very hard um, for them to do that. So they just can't, they're blind to so, it. So that's why the mRNA technology, and I'd like to put in a mention of, you know, yeah. I had some vaccines that weren't mRNA and they were yeah. pretty good too, and they were made with a very similar technology. But sure. um, you can have that change the world and to some extent save the world, and yet people still don't see the long-term potential of those investments. I mean, I, I, yeah, I, I think the, the I, I would say people see the potential today in the MR, in therapeutics in the, around that. I think the, the general challenge is like, how do we create broad awareness of synthetic biology as a technology motion? Mm -hmm. Like computers were a technology motion. And, and to me, the root thing, just, just so you have it in your head, is fundamentally like programmability. That's the magic thing, right? Like why were computers such an awesome, broad technology? Well, you put in new computer code into the same machine and magically it does a new thing. Like, oh, I downloaded this thing and now I can call a car. Like, you know, like Apple didn't design it to do that. They designed it to process information. But the fact that it can take in digital code and just magically do a new thing is its superpower. 
Okay, like this table is not like that. I can't just like slap some code I can in there. Put anything and it, on this table. It, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nothing wrong with this table. It's a great table. But like, but you know, it doesn't have that power. Computers have that power. Mm -hmm. But and, and biology has that power, Oliver. So, 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 so what we have to explain to people is that it, once it starts happening, it will suddenly impact everything broadly fast mm -hmm. because you will just start putting new code in and suddenly it's an ag product. Suddenly it's a pharma product. Suddenly it's a new table material, right? Like, all, all, like we all start to have happen in the physical world what happened with computers, which is just rapid product cycles because it's code. That's the distinction and that... You people, this crowd understands those sentences and no one else in the world understands those sentences. Okay, that, that's a secret you all have and it's true. But computers needed, the programmability is obviously the technological essence of the computer, but as a business proposition, the computers needed what people call the killer apps. Sure. And, um, oh, do you not think we not have killer apps I'm in the physical you world, you, Oliver? I'm, I'm asking you, no, I'm asking you Shall what Shall we look apps? around? The, 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 this, I mean, COVID is a great example of this. Like, where were, there's this amazing uh, blog post from like Mark Andreessen uh, uh, where it's like, tech, tech save the world from COVID because like Zoom. You're like, give me a break. Like, like software and tech, the most powerful companies in the world sat on the sidelines for three years mm -hmm. while the world burned because it wasn't in the digital realm. It's, you, tech is useless outside of the digital realm. And we don't live there, metaverse, or, you know, like nonsense or not. We live in the fucking meatverse, okay, right? Like, and, the, and all of the applications, like, they're myriad. Food security, like, especially right now, food security, renewable energy, carbon capture. Do you, any, any working atmospheric carbon capture technology you can think of? Plants, you know, right? Like, 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 like the, the, we don't have... Like our whole infrastructure, the last 50 years of tech has made us crazy, like obsessed, no offense to Tom who ran, ran, who got us here, but like obsessed with the digital world. And the reality is that's not where we live. And so do I think there are killer apps? Yes, I think there are trillions on trillions on trillions of dollars. The entire physical world is an application for Symbio. End of story. Okay, then I'm gonna ask you about one that I'm particularly interested in. Right. And also you mentioned war and it's not obvious what Sinbio has to do with war other than in bad ways. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the aspects of the terrible war now going on in the Russian invasion of Ukraine is what it's done to the world fertilizer market. Yeah. Now you're in involved in this through, your, through what was a joint venture with Bayer but is now something a bit different. But yeah. tell us a little bit about how you can change the world's fertilizer market. Yes. Okay, so this is a great example and I also think a good one to like just talk to people about when you're talking about synthetic biology, right? So how do we get fertilizer today, right? So I was a chemical engineer. We get it through a process called Haber-Bosch, which is basically pull nitrogen out of the air through a giant chemical plant, burn natural gas to the- Lots of natural gas. Yeah, yeah. it's like 5% globally of natural gas. So two to 3% of, of CO2 emissions are burning natural gas, combine nitrogen from the air with hydrogen from the gas, you get ammonia. You put it in a bag, ship it off to farmers, put it on a field, all right? Half of it goes to the crops, half of it runs off. You get like a local environmental problem with, you know, like these algae blooms and things like that. And then you get a global environmental problem because of all the greenhouse gas. Well, we got to eat, right? You know, right? Like, like there's a reason we, we make $70 billion a year of, of synthetic fertilizer. We need food, all right? Well, certain crops like soybeans, they don't need much fertilizer. Why? Well, in their roots, they have nitrogen-fixing microbes running Haber-Bosch, pulling nitrogen out of the air, making it available to the crop. So why don't we use these for other crops? Well, corn, wheat, and rice, half a global fertilizer, they just didn't evolve to have these microbes. It just didn't play out that way. We wish they did, but mm -hmm. they didn't. So what do we do? Well, we're synthetic biologists. First, we go learn from nature because, by the way, we don't invent any of this as a humility reminder to you. We go out and look. We didn't invent the flagellar motor. We go look to nature and learn. So we learn how do the microbes do it that live on soy. And you find these genes and you get the whole, and then you say, okay, could I move that into the microbes that live on corn or wheat? And then they would have this ability. And that's the project. Mm -hmm. It's a big project. We're not the only ones working on it. There's also a company called Pivot Bio, the, 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 it's an old, old school Sin Bio crowd, also working on it. And, and so like, it's a great, like holy grail project and frankly, doable because we know it, biology already does it. So, so like that should work. Like if we put the effort in and we spend the money on it, like it's got a good chance. And like, heck yeah, that, that is a giant, that's a giant cut out of CO2 emissions. 
Okay. That's a killer app, you know, right? Like, like these are, I mean, are these things easy? No. But like, are they, should they be working on these more than the idiot metaverse? Yes. Right? Like, like, like is that not more important? Right? So, so, so and, and they are going to be just as valuable, more valuable. Mm -hmm. Right? The entire tech world orbits around an ad market. No one notices this. Like, no one likes to talk about it. But it, it's all like, all of that is all just driving up through like a relatively, you know, it's not the biggest market in the world. So it's ads. Most of it. I'm, I'm feeling the frustration because it must be frustrating that you say, what did tech narrowly construed do during the, uh, during the pandemic? Well, it's that they're getting more valuable. Well, contributing it is value. I'm just trying to convince this crowd not to go into tech, Oliver. The, the, uh, <laughs> it's interesting because in the old days, it's yeah, like, but it's true. I mean, listen, like, like companies make money. Right, we used to have high to convince them not to go into banking. Oh God! Yeah, <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen. Yeah. So someone, I, I was talking to a friend and saying I'm going to be talking to Jason. What's the one question that's most important to ask him? And obviously, it's nitrogen. That was the most important question. But he said, "What happens when synthetic biology gets out of control?" Yeah. And so I said. Is synthetic biology under control? There you go. That is but the right the answer. But the question is, what happens if the, uh, if the attempts to make people aware of synthetic biology, we do not live in um, a clean slate media universe. We do not have information that isn't fought with misinformation and disinformation. How bad could that be for the future of these people if people start, as people have done about other technologies, deliberately telling lies about them? Okay, got it. Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll answer the question two ways. One of, like, biology just getting out of control. And then right. two, the, the narrative of, yeah. of symbio getting out of control. So, so the first point about biology getting out of control, I, I think the right attitude is, like, we did not invent biology. Biology invented us. It, it is our conceit to imagine that we can control it. Right? You know, like, like it has four billion year head start on us in complexity. It, it, it is... It, 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 like if, there's a reason we really are big fans of Jurassic Park at Ginkgo. One, it ex shows the wonder of biology. You see a T-Rex, you're like, holy shit, biology is awesome. Number two, life finds a way, right? Like that's true, right? Like life finds a way. It, it, it is not like, it is not, biology is programmable like a computer. It is not predictable like a computer. And we should just accept that. It doesn't mean we shouldn't use it. By the way, we do. All of our food is made with this, you know, this system, right? Like, like our air is produced, our atmosphere, our atmosphere made by biology, right? Like all, our fundamental human systems are all driven by this thing that's not under our control, mm -hmm. okay, right? And, and so, so first you accept that, and then, and then I think that's the first point, because if you don't approach it with that humility, you're going to screw up, all right? So that, does that make sense on the yeah. control? All right, fine. So then on the narrative side, I mean, that's why I wanted to, to give a little bit of touch on you as ambassadors in this room is, is about that, right? And so I think it's one, you know, go out with humility. Number two, go out with transparency, right? Like, do not go out as a scientist trying to prove it with your data, right? But like, talk to the fact that people are, are being very rational when they come with an emotional response and say like, hey, this seems scary, or I don't understand this, or why would I trust you, you know, right? Those are great questions for all of us. And, and so I think if people go out with that footing, that's your best chance, right? But like, of course it's gonna be crazy. Everything is crazy, right? You know, like that's, that's inevitable. But, but I, I generally feel like humans over time adopt technologies that are in the direction of goodness for them. Uh, and, and it just sometimes takes a little bit of time at the beginning. I think the best way of putting that um, is from the moral philosopher Nora O'Neill, um, British moral philosopher, who puts it very simply. You can't do anything about trust. You can do something about trustworthiness. You can be trustworthy. That's a thing that you can do as a person. You can't make yourself trusted. And I think that's a really strong, really strong model for, for how to do, actually, synthetic biology and for what it's worth, because it's not worth very much, journalism. Um, thanks, here, here. Jason. That was a really good talk. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you, Thanks Oliver. a lot, man. Appreciate it. Okay.